The world today is very different from the world that once was. China has warned the Philippine Air Force to leave the disputed South China Sea. As imperfect as the modern world may seem, there was a period in our history where our nation was truly veiled in darkness. When deception, hatred, and evil were the law of the land. It was a world that promised no hope, no freedom, and no future. But it was also a world that our ancestors refused to accept. This is the story of the bravest generation Filipinos in the 20th century. Of young boys who stood up for their values to fight for their freedom. Of heroes, of legends. This is the story of the unsurrendered. This is the story of the Hunters ROTC Guerrilla. In my experience, I've been worse. I was on Dewey Boulevard in my backyard when they came in. Nung tinitignan namin sila nung pumasok sa Pateros on January 2nd when they came. Napunta ro, nagbibisikleta. I remember a lot of bicycles. I don't know where they stole them from. But um, they went right by the house and they, they yelled bonsai to us kids. What did we know? We yelled Banzai back. The Japanese officer came up to my grandmother and smacked her. Down she went, right on the ground. She was an old lady. The Japanese was talking to my father in Japanese. How could my father ask her? So he slapped my father. That's when the war began for me. They were not friendly. Malalaman mo sa sarili mo. We try to avoid them. Ay na lang, dumat, dumating pa yung mga Pilipinong kasama nila mga siraulo. Yun ang mga nag-umpisa ng pagano ng para magkagalit na lahat. When the Japanese took over, what was surprising was the number of those who were speaking for the Americans shifted and started supporting the Japanese. Uh, one of these would be Jorge B. Vargas, who becomes chairman of the Philippine Executive Commission. And you have people like Benigno Aquino, who start speaking for the Japanese even before Bataan Falls. I was already old to know when he was anti-American, anti-democracy. we don't like them. So they come out in the headlines in February of 1942. And this is public knowledge. This is in the newspapers. And the question there is, why would they come out in the open at that time? They encouraged the Japanese to protest the Filipinos. No, they didn't fight. Enough of that. We have, have to go to combat because of what they did to my father. There were three phases to World War II in the Philippines. Phase one, they call it the Philippine Defense Campaign from the Japanese sneak attack on Pearl Harbor and Manila, December 8, 1941, up to May 6, 1942, when the United States uh, military authorities in Luzon surrendered. The second stage was from May 6, 1942, the end of American authority in the Philippines, to October 20, 1944, with the return of MacArthur. And the second stage is the meat of the Filipino contribution to World War II. The guerrillas themselves called this the Philippine Guerrilla Movement. And stage three 
the Philippine Liberation Campaign, beginning with the later landing and ending with the surrender of Yomashita to Filipino guerrillas in Kiangan, Ifogao. After the invasion, then the Filipinos and the Americans began to fight. They put up very stiff resistance on the northern part of the Bataan Peninsula. We had the idea that we have to defend the country. Even the national anthem has that clause in it, never shall invaders trample thy sacred shores. You go all the way back to Lapu-Lapu, you go to Bonifacio, the Katipunan. And so when the Japanese landed, the instinct was this is not a war between Japan and the United States. We are attacked. It's our country that's here. So we have to fight. We have to defend. The youngsters at that time were being inculcated practically with uh, feelings of patriotism, nationalism. But the Philippines are your country and the only country God has given you. You must live for it and die for it if necessary. You'll have to remember that during the 1930s and 1940s, Filipinos were already promised independence by America as early as 1935. Teenagers, the college students, the, even the high school students wanted to join and play their role in the war. Some of them could see that their grandparents had participated in the revolution, Bonifacio and the others, and now they said, it's our turn now. We, we're going to fight now. My personal experience in this is what my father told me. He was a second-year cadet at the Philippine Military Academy at the time that the war broke out. Only the third and fourth-year cadets of the PMA were enlisted into the regular Philippine Army. The second-year cadets and the freshmen were told to go home. We were all in the truck, we were all in the truck. We were all in the truck, we were all in the truck. We were all in the truck, we were all in the truck, we were all in the truck. Baba kami saan kami ngayon pupunta. Hindi sila pinadala sa bataan kasi they, I think there was a policy to, to preserve the youth or something. So hindi yung mga hindi ano, they were left behind. They were considered either too raw or too untrained or too young. The other ostensible reason they said was there was no firearms for these people so it was useless. But I think the main reason was these are youngsters, this is the hope of the country, let's preserve them for the future. So, despite the fact that they did not become official soldiers defending the country, what did they do? The Hunter's ROTC was first mustered on January 15, 1942, primarily by some of the first-year cadets of the Philippine Military Academy who were residents of San Juan. There were three PMA cadets of different years. Miguel Ver was actually a member of class 43, but he was turned back for academic reasons to class 44. My father was class 44, and Gustavo Ingles was class of 45. So you had the class of 43, 44, and 45. And because of seniority, si Miguel Ver, ang kanilang first military commander. By PMA culture, he was immediately looked upon as the leader because he's the oldest. Now, of course, the number of cadets in those classes was too small, so later on they opened it to their other colleagues, their friends, who were from different universities and colleges in Metro Manila and ROTC cadets. They're all young men. They wanted to serve. They looked for uh, venues to be able to do so. They invariably end up with our people in San Juan. We are not studying anymore. Why don't we do something for the country? The idea was, since they were not allowed to join the rest of the USAPE, that they would form a second front in what is now Metro Manila to divert some of the attention of the enemy to themselves and thereby relieve the pressure of the Japanese on the defenders of Bataan. By April 6 of 1942, which was just Four months later, they had already gone up to the hills. Punta tayo dun. 
Una, hindi ko alam yung doon. Hindi ako malang Tagalog eh. Basta doon. Eh, dito kami napunta. Tuloy kami doon sa likod ng Antipolo. The first batch was about 70 to 80 young boys with suitcases going up to the hills. But Colonel Ingles said it all when he told me, Alam mo, para kami mga bata lang eh. Para kami nagpipiknik lang. We were just parang having fun. The hunters group started with almost nothing. They had no shoes, they had no bullets, they had no gun. And so they had to find a source for it. Nego usapan, how can we get arms? Union College was the first target. Kinuha ang Japanese yung mga arms at saka nilagay doon. Pinakasentro ang yung niraid ng mga hunters. Ang ispian namin doon si English, Gustavo English. Dahil si Tavo mukhang bata eh, batang bata talaga. Kasi karamihan sa amin, adiboso, spikulano, hindi na ito Tagalog. Ako, Bisaya, hindi ko rin alam Tagalog. Oh, ang marunong lang, yan si English. Yun lang ang Tagalog. Eh. Ang ganda lang planong ginawa ni Terry dyan. Inisip ni Terry yung how to get there, how to transport them, how to avoid the Japanese sentries na nagmamahal ka doon sa kalsada. Napasok nila yan. Once they got in, they began sewing the bars. Isang pamilya ang gumagawa dyan. Babae, lalaki, mga anak na maliliit pa. And the person in charge there did not want to let them get the arms. And he, in fact, he threatened to shout and tell the Japanese, look, they are going to steal our arms. And dali naman takotin. And eventually they pacified him. And so that he would not be held responsible, he said, we will tie you up and we will cover your mouth. So it seemed that he was a victim of this. And they did take the firearms out, again, very delicate uh, operation, but they, this became the nucleus of the firearms of the hunters, ROTC. Ang mga hunters na mali, ang karamihan ay batang bata. The Japanese will doubt that he can fight at hindi magkakaroon ng isip na iskunin niyo or mas doon nagkamali ang Japanese. They would be going to the armory having fake documents with orders na itatransfer yung mga baril. Officer Cass, present your documents, orders, transfer yung baril. O, oh, di ikakarga ng mga hapon. And then there's one anecdote, sabi nga ni Colonel Nobales, namatay yung makina nung sasakyan nila. So yung mga hapon pa nagtulak para umandar ulit. Filipino ingenuity yan eh. I mean, you just, nandiyan ang baril, use your brains. Imagine, binibigay sa yung baril. That you're only able to do this because you're so sure of yourself, kaya-kaya mong gawin yan. They felt na we are in control of our country. But they could only do so many raids and not attract the attention of the Japanese. The Japanese already had sufficient intelligence to realize that something was going on and they were able to follow the hunters all the way to their camp. Mike Bear, in a very dramatic gesture, manned a machine gun to enable his comrades to escape at the cost of his life. So on that day, survivors of the Japanese raid on the hunters' camp realized the seriousness of the situation. So now, their main motivation, in addition to idealism, was revenge. And the first expression of that revenge was the ambush at Pugadlawin. Gagante tayo. Ang mga Pilipino, lalo na mga hunter, iba ang ugali. Alam mo, there, there was a place, Pugadlawin kung pangalan, it's a mountain that was cut in the middle so that a road can be passed through. Pogadlawin is in the boundary of Rizal and Laguna. It's kilometer 69. Kasi nandun ako sa tabi ng kilometra eh. They decided that they were going to stage an ambush along that route. They stayed there for three days. And it was already Terry Adiboso who was the head of the hunters. Terry Adiboso, ano siya eh? Natural born leader. I was brighter than, than he in the school, the academy, but in the field, no comparison. 
cemetery, naglagay ng tao on both sides. May nakuha pa silang machine gun on that side and on this side. Ang sabi ni Terry, at that signal. So they ambushed a Japanese convoy of 200 and there were just 19 of them. Pagdating sa isang lugar eh, nagpaputok. All 200 Japs, walang binuhay. Walang binuhay. Blood flowed sa espalto. That was actually one of the very first guerrilla attacks in the Tagalog area. Before their actions, the Filipinos, especially in Manila, they were downcast. They looked at the ground because they felt defeated. And only by these actions were the Filipinos heartened. You mga Filipinos realized, hey, the Japanese can be beaten. Eko yung mga Boy Scout, hindi mo iba tawag sa kanila mga Boy Scouts eh, kasi mga bata ka. They had this image na nananalo yung mga yan. So, yun, nagkaroon na ngayon ng ganun, support from the general population. Ang guerrilla is only strong kung ang population around are supportive. It was like an uh, advertisement. Kung baga, ang dali na mag-recruit. So they started recruiting the locals, 90% of what turned out to be eventual Hunters ROTC membership came from the ranks of farmers and fishermen. Mga sapatero ng Marikina, yung mga nag-aasindyo sa Paranaque, mangingistay around the Laguna Lake. All of them were in the eyes of the Filipinos, Hunters ROTC. But they were very choosy, even with uh, the so-called masa, that they had to understand basic English, that they knew how to follow instructions. Hindi yung bang may baril ka, sumama ka. The hunters eventually became 25,000 armed men. The Japanese, realizing that the guerrilla resistance movement was very strong, carried out several anti-guerrilla operations throughout their stay in the Philippines. This they called punitive operations, punitive actions, and a lot of this had been developed in China to counter the guerrillas in China. They had what they called the Sona, in which case they encircled a particular town. Then they would arrest all of the men, bring them to the church, and keep them there. They would have a collaborator with a bayong covering his head, and this collaborator would be asked to point out the guerrillas, and he would point out to who was who. Whether this was correct or not, we don't know. But whoever that was pointing had to point to somebody, or else he would be punished himself. 200 plus were all rounded up and brought to the church. And then they were murdered. They were murdered. Ako. Nasaw na ako. Sa bagay walang pinatay sa amin. Pero at that time na hinuli kami, girilya na kami. Isang gabi, inakilat kami ng hapon. Tinatanong kong nasaan yung mga kapatid ko, mga magulang ko, si inang, si tatang. Sabi ko, hindi namin alam. Pagka sumasagot akong ganun, bugbog yung kaburata. Ang binubugbog sa akin, yung anlaman pala nyo ni Bakal. Nagpapakain kami ng gerilya, kaya galit na galit ang hapon. Another counter guerrilla operation would be the use of or threat of torture to people they arrested. Unfortunately, in this dragnet fell uh, Vic Novales and Gustavo Ingles. Ingles was captured and brought to what was called the airport studio in Manila at that time and subjected to severe torture. He's a high-ranking officer, so he must have a lot of information. According to my dad, the worst was the placement of bamboo shards in the tips of his fingernails. That's when he lost consciousness. The loss of blood 
could really kill you. Eh. All this he endured and hindi siya kumanta. You reach your breaking point eh. But in his case, no, even with them pulling out his nails, he was able to think clearly and prevent himself from giving out information by devising a very good plan, accepting, admitting to everything with a lot of ex exaggeration. Would love him. You say, yes, I was there. I personally killed 1,000 Japanese. He exaggerated a lot. So the Japanese came to the conclusion, this guy must be crazy. So they no longer believed his uh, admissions and just left him alone. Try to have your nails pulled out. You will admit to killing Jose Rizal. As for Colonel Vic Novales, they waterboarded him. <laughs> but he would escape the binds. So they could not get anything out of him either. And he was so strong that he could absorb the regular feasts. Being a guerrilla, their bodies were very, ano, yung titigas. So you just act like you're being hurt. Pero actually, hindi. Ano ka lang, sa, umaaray ka lang, pero hindi ganong kasakit. Yung hampasin ka ng kahoy. He just pretended he was hurt. I was asked by Adiboso through a message from Peralta to inquire three questions which were confidential. No? There was a question about Laurel nga kung talagang he's pro-Japanese or not. Colonel Docampo went inside Malacanang to the room of the President. Doon sa mga palasyo mismo, yung office ng President, may isa pang office dito, may bintana dyan. Yung sa second floor. On the other side, na hindi pa nakakahala tayo hapon, was just there, not realizing guerrilla na itong nandun sa kabilang kwarto na tinatanong na si Laurel. Are you going to declare war? Yan ang isa sa mga person. Sabi niya, why? A state of war already exists. I did not understand the answer. But uh, minimorize ko na lang ang, ang answer. Eh, hindi man ako politiko. Hindi man ako. I don't understand that language. State of war already exists. Number two, are you going to conscript uh, Filipino youths? No. The third question. Why did you accept the position? Because somebody else was going to accept it. You know, talagang pro Japanese. So he was actually asked to accept the position para hindi na iba ang maasain. So don palang alam nila hindi pro Japanese si Laurel. Pero for the longest time, ang tingin kay Laurel pro Japanese. They were asking us, what would you do to those people who are pro-Japanese? It produces a hate. Yung ginagawa nila, hindi namin nagugustuhan. Kaya sa amin, walang difference sa patay niya mga yan. We don't like them. Pick them up. Kill them. Well, short of saying na hindi naman in-identify ng tatay kung sino-sino yun, marami rin silang na-disgrasya na gano'n dahil ang ayaw na ayaw nila. Yung ganap ang tawag nila rin eh. Ganap or makapili. Yung uh, talaga collaborator ng hapon. Pero isa sa mga mission nila kasi yun na nakakakilala sa kanila. Gusto nila maubos lahat yun. The hunters had to learn their guerrilla tactics, not from the PMA. They had to learn it from Edgar Snow, Red Star over China. That was one of their main texts and Seven Pillars of Wisdom by Lawrence of Arabia. So, knowing the principles laid down by the like of Chute and Mao on guerrilla operations, they were very strict. That, that is why the hunters had a provo marshal. And the provo marshal was uh, Jaime Ferrer. Jaime Ferrer is the judge advocate general. So any grievance against a hunter 
had to go through him. Ina-investiga niya kung ikaw talagang guerrilla o kung ikaw talagang espiya o ikaw ay hapon o kung ano man. They really executed guilty parties. Ako executioner eh. I took care of an old man and uh, I asked him, Lolo, pero ba kayong gusto ipagpilin dahil ang uh, sentensya ko sa inyo eh, kayo babarili namin. I said, Lord, patawarin mo kami lahat. Itong mga naka, naka, nakahuli sa akin, eh, tumutupad na ba sa kanila tungkulin at sa kanila paninawala. Ako, Meron din ako ibang paninawala at kung ako makahuli sa kanila, sila naman ang nasa pwesto ko. So, Diyos, sabi niya, patawarin niyo kami, kami lahat. I was about to give up shooting him, <laughs> but uh, I have to show my soldiers that when you are given an assignment, you do it. Japanese Kimpitai after conference. Humingi ng meeting si Sakai. Captain Sakai was the Japanese garrison commander and Kimpitai head. And he was a gentleman. Hindi masyadong salbahe. Kaya ang hunter para pumayag. Sakai was educated in the States at one point, so he spoke English. He understood uh, what conditions were. He was able to actually open up and allowed the guerrillas, the hunters, to come in to meet him. When the hunters came, they were very happy. The guerrillas were very happy. They were very happy. They were very happy. They were very happy. The reputation of the hunters by this time had become so ferocious that they felt that they were professional soldiers and that they were older. And so when they came face to face with Sakai, they were really so young, they were so innocent looking. It's there that they tried to negotiate a peace, a Christmas truce at least. So, why are you fighting? One of his questions. This is my country. This is my country. Sakai gave a pistol to the hunters and the hunters gave him something in return. May request ng mga hunters ng tulong kay Sakai, which Sakai approved. So at least the idea was there that you know, we can negotiate. Yung pala, nalaman ng marking yung usapan ng hunters at ni Sakai. Hinold up nila to. They got the arms na pambibigay sa hunters. Pinaday si Saika ng Marquegis. Ano ginawa? Sino na yung bayan ng Japanese dahil sa katarantaduhan ng Marquegis? There were so many guerrillas during that time and instead of fighting with Japanese, they also had jealousy among themselves. In the case of Marking's guerrillas and the hunters, it was really more of a case of turf warfare. They operated in the same area. Rizal, first at the beginning. And because they operated in the same area, they were going to the same barrio people to get limited food, limited medicine, limited clothing, limited support. There's bound to be friction. And that is what naturally happens. But if you look at them in terms of the persons within the groups, the hunters ROTC were younger, 17, 18, early 20s. Uh, many of them were college students and therefore educated. Many of them spoke English very well. The Markings guerrillas, on the other hand, were usually older, late 20s, 30s, and uh, they were workers, they were peasants. In fact, Marking himself was an auto mechanic and a bus driver. So comparing that with the hunters, you'd see that there would probably be some rivalry. College students versus local peasants and local workers. The young people felt they were better because they knew military tactics to ROTC or PMA. Ang babata pa nitong mga ito, siyempre mapupusok pa. They still have the anger of youth, they still have the pride of youth. Of course, the older people in Markings felt they were better because they were older, they were more experienced, they saw things in different light. At one point, in fact, 
more kings would almost declare war on hunters. You have these personal issues between the two groups. In uh, June of 1944, the hunters ROTC decided to try to liberate some of their compatriots who had been arrested by the Japanese and imprisoned in Munting Lupa. Munting Lupa raid is one of the nicest raids na ginawa ng Pilipino. Wala pang Amerikano. It was done because of the fact na yung kanila mga officers, practically a lot of them were already incarcerated in the National Believed Prison, including Colonel Nobales. Sarah de Bosser uh, was afraid that uh, the Japanese might massacre the inmates of the Believed uh, compound. So he had to figure out a way to rescue his comrades. Adiboso instructed Colonel de Ocampo and yung ibang officers mag-isip kayo ng plano paano natin kukuhanin yung mga kasamanan. Madali-dali na yun. Kasi dalawang beses namin ni Raid yung Bilibid. Ngayon muna, Raid was a failure. Ibig sabihin na failure, we were not able to penetrate. Kasi marami pa lang aso dun sa daan namin na nagtaho lang ng bombaryo. So we, we started again cultivating friendship among the guards. They decided to do this in a very dramatic fashion. When they carried out the plan in June 1944, they did this in a very rehearsed manner. Colonel Bikistashio told me that he dressed up as a Japanese officer. In the midnight, he banged on the gate and the prison guards were confused, so they thought he was a Japanese officer. They opened the gates and in went the assault team. This time, tatlong pasok namin. Isa doon sa main gate, isa doon sa galing sa Carmona, isa galing Paranaque. And once they got in, they threatened the guards, you better release the prisoners. And they asked one of their friends who was in the fuse box to shut the lights off. And then the gates were opened and the hunters who were in prison were asked to move out. Very strategic sila. Now we're only going to rescue the people who we know. Kaya hindi naman talaga masusulban lahat eh. Let's be realistic. They were very quick. They were able to get their comrades from their cell. Nani Guerrero was the one who raided the radio room. And they even disarmed the warden. Napasok nila yung National Believed Prison. Nakuha nila yung laman ng arbory. Nakuha nila lahat ng mga official nila. In 45 minutes. And so it was a very, very daring raid. And they all rushed out. And when they rushed out, they were met by different groups and immediately shuttled to other places so that they could not be tracked. So it was a successful raid. It's even celebrated in the city of Muntinlo pa today. And ang nagturo sa kanila nung sarili lang nila how to do it. My father's uh, unit tried to get into radio contact with MacArthur. There was what was called the scramble for Southwest Pacific area recognition. This was because if they were recognized by headquarters, by MacArthur, they would become legitimate guerrilla groups. Because the problem was the Japanese called them bandits. They were not in uniform. So under international law at that time, guerrillas were actually not subject to uh, the laws of warfare. So if they were given recognition by SWPA, that would make them no longer simply just guerrillas or bandits. They were now recognized as part of the armed forces of the U.S. and the Philippines. Think of it as like being registered as a formal guerrilla unit. SWPA recognition is very essential because if MacArthur did not recognize you, you'd have no participation at all in any of uh, the activities that MacArthur planned for the Philippines. They were very keen on that. No? Being part of the world effort, the world united front against fascism. They would also have access to weapons. They would have access to American aid, unlike those guerrilla groups that were not recognized. MacArthur starts funneling in supplies because Smith and Parsons tell him about all these different guerrilla groups all throughout the islands. And MacArthur makes the case, we're going to set you up in the pre-war military districts. We're going to start sending in teams, radio operators, sabotage experts, weather teams, air warning teams to be able to set up all throughout the islands to get ready for the return. 
to prepare the way for the Luzon landings, uh, Colonel de Ocampo and the rest of the hunters met with some of these submarines, including the one at Infanta. And so when the submarine came in 1944, it brought with it a lot of modern weapons. Some of the weapons were very modern, for example, the M1 carbine, which was very fit for Filipino soldiers because it was very light, it was accurate, easy to operate, not like the heavier guns that they had had before the war. So modern weapons came in, the carbine, some rifles, and of course, medical equipment and other modern material as well. Binibigyan pati kami ng uniform, pagkain, mga dilata. All these guerrillas are ready to go. They're well supplied. And that's the great advantage he has coming back to the Philippines is that guerrilla resistance movement. The landing in Nasugbu, it was Sabo Ingles who had the password para alam ng mga landing forces na they were the legitimate contacts of the American forces here. When the Americans started landing in January, the hunters went ahead and started liberating towns. Some units of the hunters would actually be heavily engaged in fighting in southern Manila. The liberation of Pateros, Taguig, and then the liberation of the bulk of Fort McKinley was essentially an hunter's ROTC operation. Sina Bane Ocampo, they were the ones who drove out the Japanese at Camp McKinley. The defenses in the south were very strong. Fifty thousand Japanese soldiers went up the hills established defensive positions up there. The Japanese had been expecting the main effort to come from the south. They were forming the Shimbo line to protect the southern front of Yamashita. So all these people from Laguna, Bicol region, they were forced to march here and go up and form that line. Unfortunately, we were there. Japanese are coming up, we will go down. <laughs> and so I had six encounters. There is also a story that my father told me. It's, and it happened in the lake where uh, they were in a, in a banka. It was a moonlit night when I heard the sound of the Japanese patrol boat. Chug, 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 chug. When my father saw that the patrol boat was going in their direction and to apprehend them, he gave instructions right away. He said, we have no choice. We got to fight it out. Then, smoke rose up from Angono. Sino sunog na ang bayan Angono? Sino sunog? Salamat sa patusaklimente. Dahil sa sunog na yun, natakpan ng mga ulap. At hindi sila nakita ng mga hapon. Natakpan ng full moon. The sea was... Uh, Dark again. Kako battle stations. <laughs> Parang Nepal, Lego. We will only fire at close range. As the boat was getting nearer, uh, because they were not firing, so uh, I, I presume the Japanese thought, you know, these are just uh, ordinary fishermen. Until the last moment when uh, they were very near and the Japanese uh, were caught by surprise, they were not able to return fire anymore. Pinaril nila yung below the waterline. They lubog. Truthfully, during that time, death never crossed my mind. That's honest with this. 
I knew that I would not die. I don't know why, but that's my feeling. Yung pong liberation ng College Los Banos Laguna noong February 23, 1945. Gustavo Ingles, he was the one in charge of coordinating all the guerrilla elements. He just came from the National Philippine Prison. He should have just uh, sat out the rest of World War II after having lost his move. But it's the nature of guerrilla warfare, you keep on fighting. He gathered the information and they were able to formulate a uh, Plan. What the hunters did was they couldn't do it alone, and so they linked up with other guerrilla units in the area. There were eight guerrilla groups involved in the Los Banos raid. Among them, President Quezon's own guerrillas, even the Hukbalaha. The Wachi, a Chinese guerrilla group, and you have other guerrilla groups who they managed to talk with, negotiate, and put up a, a united front against the Japanese. Including Marquis, who was there? They divided the uh, work um, who will be the blocking force, who will assault it. Yung pong hunters are OTC, 45th raid, siyang attacking force. The Americans were supposed to participate in the raid by dropping paratroopers. After the paratroopers would secure the area, these amphibious landing tanks would be sent in from Laguna de Bay and brought into Los Banos. Everyone would be taken out. Eight guerrilla groups voted for a unified ground commander. That was a honorio naming kay Guerrero. So when the day came to liberate uh, Los Banos, the hunters ROTC played a very key role in neutralizing the Japanese positions. Kami po lamang ang unit na pumasok mismo sa College Laguna upang maisalba namin yung 2147 allied internist na naka-schedule na masakarin na ng mga hapon. They caught the Japanese at their morning exercises and they were shooting them, you know, like chickens. The Americans dropped in when this was already going on. The Americans came late because they did not have enough troops. In effect, they just moved in, they fired the last shot, and then got the internees out on attributes. It was actually the largest PLW rescue in World War II. It was bigger than the uh, celebrated Cabanatuan raid. And the Los Banos raid is a major event in stage three of World War II in the Philippines, the Philippine Liberation Campaign. Binigay sa akin yung bandera at yun ano, ako sige, rest the flag. They rest the flag, they nirest ko yung bandera noon. So you can notice something about World War II history in the Philippines. It was not a history of defeat, it was a history of victory. Of course, you had the Bataan death march. But actually, the sacrifices at Bataan and Corridor paved the way for a stronger guerrilla force around the country. Those who refused to surrender entered the resistance, creating one of the strongest underground forces throughout history. We call these guerrilla people unsurrendered because they did not surrender to the Japanese, and they continued on defending the country. Let us accept that there was a time of victims of Filipinos, but there was also a time that we should know that the Filipinos were not victims. They took hold of their own fate and they won. These guerrilla victories prove that our history is a history of victory.
a world of freedom, tolerance, and justice. We went about our own. We were young. We got married. We raised up our own children and a living. You cannot be fighting all the time, and especially when you have no enemy. They became engineers, they became scientists, they, they had regular jobs. But because of the exposure to command, a number of them ran for government office. You have Raul Malapos, became senator. Terry Adevoso would become instrumental in assisting the government in various capacities. A man of his vision, I salute him. Many of the ROTC people, in fact, would work very closely with the Magsaysay administration. And later on, some of the hunters served in the government of Gustavo Macapagal. Manang Ocampo became president of the Philippine Veterans Bank. And so they continued this idea of patriotism, not by fighting, but serving the government. And so, old soldiers never die. They just fade away. What the Hunters ROTC men showed was that even at a young age, you can make a mark on Philippine history. You are never young enough to play your role in developing the country. They took responsibility. They didn't wait around for the Americans or anybody to give them help. They took care of the problem themselves. It's a great honor for us. At kami napabilang din sa ganong mga lalaki, sa mga kabataan. Hindi nagalala no, ano ba, ano ba magiging pakinabang natin dito? Pinaglaban ng mga guerrilla, walang pera involved eh. Karangalan, kalayaan. You know your country. You know the problems that beset this country. And you know that we are the ones to solve, not people from abroad, not people from anywhere else, our own people. Today we don't have a war, and hopefully we will never have a war again. But there are ways by which the youth can get involved and they can make their mark on the Philippines. They're never too young to do this. It's the turn of Generation Y and Generation Z. They must step up to the plate. What better way is there to honor our veterans than to live with courage and follow your heart, to look within ourselves and be brave. To do what most people will not. To put everything on the line for what you believe in. Heroes by their very nature are exceptional. Can we expect that for the youth today? I have always been in awe of what the uh, Hunters ROTC guerrillas did. I've been hearing their stories ever since I was small. Sabi na nila, the blood that runs in our veins is that of a hero. To have an uncle and a father who were both um, people that were as teenagers responsible for liberating the Philippines, I, I feel proud. Hindi niya pinagyayabang to, pinagkukwento sa amin. I only knew about his exploits through his friends. Feeling nila pagyayabang yun. Parang ginawa ko lang yung dapat kong gawin. I don't need to brag. Ito mo yung uncle ni Bernard. At Division Commander, 44th Division. 
reunion ng pamilya nasa isang tabi, hindi kumikibo. Sometimes we take our own families for granted because they're so quiet. And when they're gone, that's when we want to ask them all of these questions. It's my responsibility na kahit paano, i-continue yung kanilang pinagmulan. At syempre, proud ka kasi hindi naman lahat ng mga tao rito sa atin ay pwedeng maging part ng history. Siyempre, proud ka na. Honored kami and proud that we belong to a family of Buhay na Bayani. I am my father's daughter and I will carry on the spirit. I didn't go through what he did but I'm proud to be a Mohika. Matapang siya eh. Talagang napaka atapang atao talaga yun. But mabait siya. He taught us na not to benefit no? from at the expense of another. He always sacrificed himself for others. He wasn't a person who imposed his vision or, you know, you should be this way or that way. He just told us the stories and bahala na kayo. Take it from there. He was not yet even 17 at that time. Proud ako sa tatay ko. Kasi sa murang edad niya, nagsimula sa 14 anos niya, pinakita niya yung tapang niya. Saka yung participation niya para ma magkaroon ng kasarinlan ng Pilipinas. Yun ang malimit niyang sinasabi. Proud na proud ako doon sa kanilang mga adventures during that time, especially nung nalaam ako na 12 years old, guerrilla na sila. Eh, hindi pa nga teenager eh, isipin mo, 12 pa lang. I owe it to my father, si General Ernesto Sanjago. Looking back at what they had done, it is a source of continuous inspiration for me in the work that I've done in my career. Uh, work that I have tried my best to focus on giving of myself in order to benefit as many others as I can. Because what they did was to put their lives on the line in order to benefit an entire nation to come into being.